So I'm Tim Abnett uh, from Native Instruments, and I'm the product owner for Complete Control Software, uh, which is the software that powers our Complete Control S-Series MK1 and the recently introduced MK2 keyboards. And in that capacity, I look after the Complete Control software workflows and hardware workflows, the integration with DAWs, and alongside that, also look after the technical aspects of the NKS SDK, which if you're not familiar with, I'll talk about a little bit later on. I'm joined by Carl Bussey, who is a software developer at Native Instruments, and Carl's worked on Complete Control software, and he also works on our effects. Now, together, uh, we designed and developed the technology that we're going to share with you uh, in today's short presentation. We're going to highlight a few things, five things. One is how we define our capability. The next one is how the technology that we're presenting was developed. Um, the other one, the next one is the workflow. And finally, how users, sorry, how users have responded. And then finally, how the technology that we've created and are sharing today can be used to very easily and very quickly make your virtual instruments, for those of you that make them, accessible. So first of all, just to explain what we mean by accessibility. Now, accessibility means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, and all of them in music technology tend to center around the democratization of music in one way or another. Often it refers to education, but in the capacity we're talking about, we're actually talking about the more traditional definition of accessibility within computing. And that is the accessibility of a computer system to all people regardless of disability type or severity of impairment. Now, if we go a little bit more granular on exactly what this means, some of you may not be so familiar with this, it generally is divided into actually five categories. So the first one of these is vision. The next one is hearing. Then we have physical and motor skills. We have learning and literacy. And then the final one, which is mental health. And today, what we're really focusing on, the work that we've done, is the first of these, which is vision. So it's estimated that there are around 285 million visually impaired people worldwide. And if you think about the music industry, actually, visually impaired people are very, very well represented. There's a lot of people, a lot of correlation. We work with sound. So there's a lot of correlation between visual impairment and music. And that really leads us challenge of today's talk, which is that a lot of virtual instruments and effects, they typically rely on visual language. So meters, knobs, things that you turn, often modeled on old hardware, but of course in a software paradigm. And they rely on this visual language to really communicate parameters, communicate values, all these different things. And that's a problem because a lot of them aren't accessible at all to visually impaired musicians producers and engineers. Now, there is technology out there that deals with this already. But generally speaking, it works on this per product level. What do I mean by that? I mean that for every single piece of software that you release, you have to make a bespoke solution. And that can be very expensive. It can be prohibitive. It's particularly difficult for, for as with many of us, small companies with very large portfolios. So instrument makers, we tend to make a lot of instruments, and they tend to be one off, and then we move on to the next one, which means the portfolio is always growing. So making these individual solutions isn't really viable. It's really expensive to do. So what we're trying to do at Native Instruments, what Carl and I are leading, is we're trying to address this problem on a top level. So we're trying to find a way, using the various technologies that we already have at Native Instruments, um, to bring all of this together under one umbrella that provides a layer of accessibility on top of all the instruments. So I'm going to talk a little bit, not in too much detail, but a little bit about how we approach this problem. And we used a technique that we use all the time at Native Instruments. It's a methodology that you may be familiar with called design thinking. Now, essentially, that's uh, defined as a framework which allows people to work together as a team to create products to solve real-world problems. So it makes sure that you're always focusing on, on, on a problem that actually exists rather than a problem that you think exists. Now, I won't go into details here, but if you want to learn more about it, I'd highly recommend you check out the literature. It's a very, very good technique. What I will say about it, though, is that at its essence, it's all about talking to users. 
So you start talking to users in your research phase. You continue talking to them all through the development play phase, the design, the development, the implementation, so on and so forth. And we've been very fortunate in this regard, actually. So we've reached out to a lot of people, and we've had a lot of people contacted us who've been really, really supportive, either user testing directly or connecting us with people. And there's a few that I want to mention specifically. Um, they're Michael Hayden and Severin Kerpier, who are at Apple, working on Logic, GarageBand. They've been really supportive. The Royal National Institute for the Blind, based in King's Cross, just down the road from here. Um, they've also connected us with a lot of people. A charity called Heart and Soul, who are also in London. Um, Priestley Smith School for the Visually Impaired in Birmingham. Uh, Roy Priest at Birmingham University and Birmingham Conservatoire. And then several individuals, Andre Louis, who's a professional musician, producer, Tim Burgess, Jason Descent, and the producer, Robin Miller. So all of these people we spoke to time and time again throughout this entire process, and they gave us a lot of inputs. And one of the things that they confirmed, perhaps unsurprisingly, is that the need for a visually impaired musician, producer, engineer is exactly the same as the need for someone who is sighted. It's not surprising, but we've had that confirmed. And if you think about that need from the perspective of, of our keyboards, for example, that's really this overarching goal that nothing should stand in the way of finding inspiration and then quickly and easily capturing an idea in a DAW. And what that means in real terms is that three things have to work really, really well, be quick, be easy, be intuitive. That's finding a sound. The next thing is making the sound that you found unique, making it your own, giving it your own stamp. And then finally, capturing an idea using that sound in whatever DAW you happen to use. So what was the accessibility aspect? Well, that was really an additional level on top. So it's the same need, but we rather see some additional requirements, some additional constraints. So I'm going to pass over to Carl, who's just going to take you through a few of those. So in front of me here, I have the complete control keyboard. Um, this hardware and the accompanying software is what we built the um, initial accessibility features upon. So I'm just going to, I guess nobody's got an awesome view of this keyboard, but maybe just imagine if you want to see it in more detail, we have a little stand over there somewhere about. Um, so basically what we have is uh, we have this center um, section here, which is the control area. So we have four soft buttons here and four encoders, and these basically can be mapped to your VST or, or DAW, your environment basically for creating music. And we have the screens here, which basically show what these uh, encoders and buttons are assigned to. So this is where basically where the first problem comes, is that we have these screens to show, which are only useful for somebody who is sighted. Uh, just to explain just briefly uh, the rest of the Hardware here, we've got an area for navigation, navigating your tracks and doors, um, navigating for different sounds. We've got a, a transport section for controlling transport of your door. And then there are some performance features, so scale features, arpeggiator features, and then we have the pitch and mod, all of this stuff you typically see on a, on a keyboard with addition of this touch strip. Um, and then we have the key bed. So of course, that, that's what makes it the keyboard. Um, so, yeah, so basically what we have here, just back to these um, encoders here. So, we have, uh, so the encoders actually have these um, capacitive abilities. So this means that when we touch a uh, encoder, we get a message which is sent from the, from the hardware to the software. And the software basically utilizes this message to basically announce what parameter is mapped to the um, to the software in the software. Sorry. So I've got here. I've got a little bass instrument loaded up, which is from one of our products, Massive. So I'm going to touch the encoder free. Macros dirty. So this is the this is the dirt. Sorry, I don't want to say that. <laughs> okay, the dirty encoder. <laughs> Um, so yeah, basically, what what the benefit of this is is that the uh, user can touch the encoder and they know exactly what they're controlling before they actually change the sound. So dirty. We've got a scream here as well, and yeah, scream. I'm not sure actually if the human league did use this instrument, but something similar. Um, 
so the next next features that we wanted to make accessible is also we've got a lot of buttons on here. So basically, what we do here is we announce. Um, we basically here we don't have the capacitive features, but we can communicate to the software when the button's been pressed, when the button's been released. So we announce here what the function of the button was on the on the press. So I'm going to activate the scale here, which basically we've got this little light guide again. Imagine maybe on top of the the key bed, um, which then can indicate what scale uh, you should be playing if you want to turn this feature on, basically. Scale on. So we announce then scale on, and then if I turn it scale off. Scale off. Scale off. Um, so one of the, uh, with the initial prototypes when we were kind of getting some feedback from some users, uh, Robin Miller, who Tim just um, mentioned, suggested that, so basically there's a feature in typical accessible interfaces which allows the user to be able to navigate the um, interface without making changes and like uh, to their project or basically making some, performing some in unintentional actions. So we have this training mode, which is a suggestion from Robin Miller. Training mode on. So I've just double clicked shift twice and I can basically. Loop, metronome, tempo, play, record, stop. And basically, can go through the whole uh, keyboard to try and navigate myself around without making changes to my project. Training mode off. And I can turn that back off to be able to then now say I want to make this change. Um, yep. So that's that slide. Um, some design considerations which uh, we were thinking of when we were implementing this is well, first of all, we wanted a simple setup, so we don't want to have these additional installations where yeah, people need to install all of these huge resources and stuff to be able to make these announcements. But all of these uh, additional like processes in the, uh, to be acquire these features would also need to be made accessible, so we wanted to try and keep it very simple. So the second thing is that we wanted to basically have some, yeah, as it says here, integration with the operating system-wide accessibility. So what we mean by that is, uh, so the voice shouldn't be talking over other applications. It should be working alongside to make everything accessible, whole uh, system accessible. Um, voice should sound similar to other applications which use these accessibility features. Um, should also have the same amount of control over voice volume, voice tone, so different voices or uh, the speeds. And additionally, because we are a um, we do make music which allows people to create computer music. Uh, we make applications which allow people to make uh, computer music. Um, the user should also be able to choose the output channel. So just to ensure that there are no conflicts between um, performances and somebody actually being able to figure out what's, what they're controlling. Um, yeah, and additionally, I guess this goes for every software solution, but it should be maintainable. And something we wanted to concentrate on there is what, what Tim mentioned before as well, is that we don't want a custom solution for all of our products. Um, at NI, we have a huge number of, of products, <laughs> so we don't want to do all of this for everything. Um, so how did we implement this implementation approach? So uh, we utilized the platform speech synthesizer, so basically, Windows and uh, Mac OS both have support for a application to be able to communicate to uh, a synthesizer and to be able to basically generate um, speech from text. Um, so this is, yeah, takes away all of the pain for additional setup for users. Um, we don't have to package ourselves as well in our installers, these huge dictionaries of words and phonemes. Um, and then there's also immediate OS integration, as I mentioned before, voices, control over speeds, control over tone, this sort of stuff. Um, and basically what we did here is we integrated this into the complete control application. Um, so the benefit of this, of doing it with, um, the, via the hardware like this, like, like I showed you before, is that we have like one dedicated access point. So as opposed to um, a generic interface like a keyboard, and a uh, mouse input. We rather have something which was designed for creating music with. Uh, it's supposed to be easy access anyway. 
um, are supposed to get you to this, yeah, the performing or riding your track as quick as possible. Um, so it was a simpler approach to be able to make the hardware accessible in this way. Um, yeah, let me just. Yeah, and basically because complete control actually acts, act, the complete control software actually acts as a host for VST plugins. Um, it's sitting sort of where you think of it as a as a layer above um, your instrument. So it's something which will control your instruments. You can use it for cross product browsing. Uh, Tim is going to take you through this how this works later, uh, but also controlling the prob uh, the the plugin itself. So this means that all native instruments, uh, virtual instruments, are actually accessible with a single effort because we implement this into the top layer program. Thank you, Carl. So I'm just going to take you through this in real terms, just show you what all of these considerations and all these things that Carl has just talked about actually mean when you're working on a project. And I'll really just take you through the, the same three pillars that I talked about at the start when I was talking about the needs. So finding sounds, making sounds unique, capturing sounds. And one key aspect is that it's at your fingertips. It's something you can do from your hardware because complete control is an instrument. So it's really about staying at your instrument and working with it and everything else being pushed to the side when you're coming up with those ideas. So I'm going to be using a, a Logic Pro 10, which is my door of choice, actually, uh, but also Apple, very much the gold standard for accessibility. So Logic Pro 10 is one of few DAWs that has a very good standard of accessibility. So I'll move over here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start just by turning on VoiceOver, which is the operating system's voice speech synthesis. Hopefully. There we go. Voice. OK. Track. Track. Good. So now I'm going to come to my keyboard. And I'm going to start just by navigating tracks, something that you're going to want to do a lot of. Track 6, MV hi-hat. So it tells me which track I'm on. That's all coming from Logic. We're just sending Logic a message. We're changing track. And Logic does the rest. Track 7, synth bass. Track 8, complete contra. Similarly, I can relocate the transport. And again, this is logic. Six bars, one bit, one division, one tick. Seven bars, one bit, one division, one tick. Six bars, one bit, one division, one tick. Five bars, one bit, one division, one tick. Now, it's worth saying at this point that um, watching a visually impaired user use this, they'll have the speech synth set much, much faster. I didn't want to do that because I can't hear it that quickly. It's actually incredible to see. Um, but uh, I've just kept it slowly just so everyone here can hear and, and also so I can follow it too. <laughs> Now, this is where the roadblock that I was talking about generally happens, because a lot of instruments aren't accessible. But as we've already said, complete control now is. And complete control is something that lives on top of all of your other instruments. So I'm going to start by finding a sound and showing you some of this. Browser. So I hit browser. As Carl mentioned, when you trigger an action, you're told where you are. So I'm in the browser, and now I'm presented on the hardware with a screen that allows me to find all my instruments. Now, we deliberately didn't put a camera over this because if you're a visually impaired user, you can't see it. So it's more just about listening and understanding how much information you can convey with these very short phrases. So I could, for example, choose a vendor. Vendor or vendors. So I'm just touching knob one. It's telling me that I've currently got all vendors selected. Um, I could product, choose a product. All products. And I'm going to go in and choose a product. Pro Flesh FMA form. Kinetic metal, kinetic toy, contact, massive, monarch, react, react, rev, rise and hit. So we're going to go with rise and hit. Now this is also divided into banks. Bank, all banks. Same principle. I can just touch the button, touch the knob, sorry, the capacitive knob. It's going to tell me that currently it's set to all banks, but I can change that. Same goes for the buttons. I can, for example, turn on favorites. Built to by favorites, on. And I did this just so I could find a sound very quickly. Um, I can also choose types, so if I don't want to choose a product, I could just say, hey, just show me all the basses or all the pianos or whatever, regardless of where they're coming from, regardless of who made them. So preset, coming to presets, cello glides one. it's going to tell me the preset and also play a little preview sample preset, of it. Preset, electronic cello. Preset, gentle sub one. Hybrid piano one. So just using audio cues, a combination of hearing a preview of the sound, and being told the information that's on the screen, I can find exactly what I'm after and load it. So once that's loaded, progress dialogue. 
Progress dialog KKSMK two underline ABC two zero one Wait, seven no, underline feet. presentation oh. KKSMK two quarterly meeting tracks window Wait, track eight complete control okay. track okay. header used to mute or Just mute that um, so I've now loaded my <laughs> so I've now loaded my instrument um, and maybe I want to make it my own I want to change something about it so what I can do is just choose any of these parameters that are laid out on pages. Rise pan and hit pan. Rise tune and hit tune. L1 rise and L1 hit. Rise tune and hit tune. Hit tune, layer one, layer two. So suddenly I know what parameters I'm changing. I'm not having to guess, I'm not just having to do it, but I actually know what's going to happen when I adjust those. And that's very, very crucial. So then it comes to recording. And here's an interesting area where perhaps I don't know where all the controls are. So I'm new to this device, I can't see it. Carl showed training mode, I can use that. Training mode on. Record. To find my record button without triggering record. Shift. Training mode on. Oop. Training mode off. So I can just now hit record and jump in here. Sorry. So just Five bars, two beats, four divisions, 212 ticks. Just put some, um, like an additional instrument in there, very, very easily, all just recording it. I can even add automation to that very quickly. Same thing goes, I can go training, training mode. Training mode on, automation. Automation. Training so mode off. Hit automation, it enables my automation, and then I can hit play, turn parameters, make these sweeping sounds. So it's really, really great for sound design and for finding instruments. Um, so just coming back to our deck here. There we go. Keynote, one, seven, underline, one, so I'll just voice, turn voice over, over off. off. Okay. So that just hopefully gives you a very brief idea of how quick and easy it is um, to, uh, for someone to make music who is visually impaired using this device. And I'm very humble to say and pleased to say that we've had a really great response to this from the user base. We've talked about users a lot today, and that's because we spent a lot of time with them. And we're always in this kind of cycle of following up with them, seeing what we should do next, have we made the right call, so on and so forth. And we've had a lot of very positive responses. Um, the, the community has been very, very supportive of us. This is a quote from Andre Louis. Um, and Andre was the very first person to actually use this stuff. He came into our office, gave us some really great feedback, and helped us to get it to where we've got it to today. We've also got a lot of high, a high level of engagement. So we've got a lot of feature requests coming in and um, we capture all these in our backlog and we can prioritize them. And we're now actually approaching 1,000 accessibility users of complete control, which is really, really good and that number's continuing to grow. It's something we're really pleased with. That said, we're definitely not there. We still consider ourselves to be at the very beginning of this journey. And we want to continue to extend these features in various ways. We want to have 100% coverage. We want to add support for things like the mixer, which you can also access from here in certain hosts, such as Logic screen reader support so that some of the software features like mapping controls yourself instead of using the pre-mapped ones are accessible, saving presets, this kind of thing. And um, one key thing about this that uh, I just want to briefly touch on is NKS, which I mentioned at the start. And NKS is a technology that we developed, which is essentially an extension to VST. And uh, it's called Native Control Standard. And what it allows you to do is it allows third party VST developers, contact developers, reactor developers to um, actually integrate instruments with complete control at the exact same level that we have for our own instruments. It's, it's not separate to our own, it's exactly the same. And this means that you essentially integrate with the browser, so native, native browsers we call it, with tagging, artwork, previews, native map, which is the parameter mapping, and then the hardware integration, so light guide, artwork, this kind of stuff. So everything that you just saw, you can also do for your instruments. And the accessibility features that we've shown essentially come for free with that. So once you've tagged everything, once you've mapped everything, then you're already in a position where your instrument is accessible via Complete Control MK2 hardware. So something we definitely encourage you to do. We have around 50 plus manufacturers on board at the moment. So Waves, Arturia, Korg, Output Heaviosity, to name a few of them. And together, they've released over 400 instruments. So it's really, really growing. And from an accessibility perspective, that's a lot of instruments that are now accessible that often previously weren't. 
the SDK is available for free uh, to any instrument developers. So if you do want more information about it, uh, we actually did a talk last year, which goes into details of how you implement it in your code with some live coding. Um, or you can speak to myself or one of my colleagues. We have a stand uh, out in the main room where you can check out the, all of the NKS instruments that are currently released. So they're all available. You can try out how the browsing works and so on and so forth. Um, and alternatively, you can email us. So anyone on the live stream or who isn't here today, feel free to email us at this address. Um, and we will start the process of getting you set up with the SDK. So thanks for listening to this short presentation. Um, I really appreciate you coming. And uh, I'll just open the floor up very briefly. We don't have very long, but open to any questions. If anyone has any at this stage. OK, do you have the microphone? Yeah. Let's just wait for the microphone to be passed over for the live stream uh, recording. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. It's very interesting and um, it's a very a big issue, is this of accessibility. Um, I've got three quick questions. Um, so the first one is, um, have you got, um, um, why did you choose to go through the path of uh, just uh, rendering a voice message rather than uh, active feedback, which is another path that many other industries are following? Um, also, if you did uh, receive any feedback from users during uh, a live situation, and the third one is, especially in a live environment, uh, as a music background in music and as a sound engineer, I know for experience that a stage can be very noisy, uh, very, very noisy, and to hear an on headphones a message can be quite, well, not possible sometimes. Mm -hmm. And uh, one more that can pop up uh, to my mind now is if a musician has headphones to listen a message um, during live music, how he can cope with other musicians while playing together? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I try and remember those. So the first question uh, was not using haptic feedback. Yeah. Partly that's because um, this is what we're working with. This is the product that we have, but also actually because uh, v VR users are very used to working with audio cues. So it's not something that's alien to them. Already they're using those in Logic and so on and so forth. So that was the main goal. Haptic interfaces, I think, are very interesting and possibly something for us to look at in the future. Um, but right now, you know, with, this is the, the um, easiest point of access for us as well to start actually making a difference um, in, this, in this way. Talking about live situations, Andre's actually just come off of a tour where he's been using the keyboard in this way. And he hasn't reported any problems. Um, I think essentially it's just something that people are used to doing. So you get used to that whole situation of something. I mean, I, I'm also a musician and perform, and you know, there are ways around that using in-ear monitoring and these kinds of things. So I guess that's really largely where we're coming from. That said, um, Complete Control is focused on the studio. So it's designed primarily as a studio device. It doesn't mean people don't use it live, but that was where the focus was. And therefore, we actually focused our efforts in that way as well. Do we have time for more or one more question? OK, so one more question. Um, did you think about uh, sonification of like MXR, like uh, parameters going up in sonification of parameters? Yeah, we've, we've actually had some interesting feedback about that as well, um, because obviously it makes sense in certain cases. Um, it's used a lot for things like progress bars as well, where you can have a pitch rising as you pass through a progress bar. That's, that's something that other applications use. Uh, so it's something that we don't do right now, um, but it's certainly something that we've, we're aware of and, and would consider for certain aspects. Like, for example, if we move to the mixer, that's a good example where perhaps that's a, a more useful thing. It's just that delicate balance of you have music playing. So you have to be very careful how you balance audio cues versus spoken cues um, without causing this conflict you know, in terms of what you're listening to. So, yeah. So I think we're out of time, but I know there were a couple more questions. So if you want to just come and grab myself or, or, or Carl later on by the stand and also in many of the workshops. But thank you again for coming. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, let us know. Try and add this support to your own plugins. Thanks very much. Okay, enjoy your lunch.